I am Johnny Massacre and welcome to The Johnny Massacre Show. This is the Monday Night Massacre. On tonight's show, Jordan B. Peterson is the victim of a hit piece in the Times newspaper and apparently he has schizophrenia. Also, Marilyn Manson has been accused of rape. Australia says, fuck off, Mike, to Google. AOC claims she's the victim of sexual assault. Myanmar is under a military coup. Tony Hawk pulls off a 720 degree spin at the age of 52 and plenty more on this jam-packed Johnny Massacre show. Who's fucking with me? Give me a hell yeah! Woo! Okay, so there's loads of shit to get through today. First of all, Jordan Peterson, who is someone I really look up to. You know him. He's the famous clinical psychologist who rose to prominence because of his refusal to use gender pronouns when some students filmed him on, I believe, a Canadian university campus because he said that would lead to compelled speech, which is basically the end of democracy and free speech. And then he rose to prominence still further due to some interviews with some hostile feminists, one of whom is one of my fellow Brits, known as Cathy Newman, he decimated them during the interview and that coincided with the release of his first book called 12 Rules for Life. After that, you might be aware that Jordan Peterson has had a real tough time. His wife contracted terminal cancer, but luckily she seems to have gotten over it in part. And Jordan Peterson, due to that, he became addicted to benzos, I believe. And due to withdrawal symptoms, he nearly died. So he's come back and his next book, the sequel to 12 Rules for Life, is imminent. It's coming out, I believe, on March the 2nd, basically the beginning of March. And so he started to do new interviews. Now, one of his first new interviews he's done is with the British The Times newspaper. And it hasn't gone very well, let's put it like that. You want to see what's going on? Let's have a look. So the first I heard about this bad interview, if you will, with Jordan B. Peterson was via a mate who linked me to the New York Post. Now, before I bring you over, I have to get my device working, which allows me to bring you over to my screen, which is not working, even though we've just started the Johnny Massacre show. So hopefully we'll be able to get through this technical hitch, people, technical hitch. We always get through it in the end, don't we? So I have this software called Stream Deck, which enables me to press a button and bring you over to my screen. But for some reason, it's not on. Oh, here it is. Wicked. I think I've saved the day. So come on over to my screen. You can see on the New York Post, the article says, Jordan Peterson says he was suicidal, addicted to benzos and has schizophrenia. Wow, that's big fucking news. If you have schizophrenia, you are basically completely fucked and you literally can't do anything and you cannot lead a, a normal life or it's going to be extremely difficult. So when I saw that, I thought, Surely not. Surely Jordan Peterson doesn't have schizophrenia. Otherwise, he wouldn't be able to speak so eloquently in public. Anyways, the article says, Jordan Peterson, in a new interview, described his spiral into drug addiction and suicidal thoughts before being diagnosed with schizophrenia and then undergoing a controversial Russian treatment that placed him into an induced coma for eight days. So this is what you are seeing. You're seeing loads of clickbait headlines screaming that Jordan Peterson has schizophrenia. And I don't I don't really know what Jordan's purpose is at the moment because all of his public appearances since all this turmoil have not been so much about the book, but it's just been talking about his drug addiction and his withdrawal symptoms and his mental health. And it, hey, look, I'm not Jordan Peterson's manager. 
and I don't know anything about management or public relations or marketing, but it seems to me that perhaps you don't want to focus on all these weaknesses and give his enemies, of which there are many who are ideologically possessed and don't care that he's obviously a good person, but they just dislike him because he's a free thinker and they find free thought dangerous because they're part of the pro-censorship left. Yes, those people, why give them all this ammunition and tell them about your mental health? Why not just focus on the book? But anyways, yeah, that seems to be what's going on at the moment. Now, the article, the interview was pretty nasty. I read it. And you can kind of see its nasty tone in the beginning. I'll bring you on over to the Times. Have a look for yourself. It, the author says, I don't know if this is a story about drug dependency or doctors or Peterson family dynamics or a parable about toxic masculinity. Whatever else it is, it's very strange. Now, there might be some s massive Jordan Peterson fans watching. And I don't want to piss anybody off especially people who idolize jordan peterson but i've just got to tell what i believe is the truth and i just want to say how i feel about all of this jordan peterson released his own transcript of this interview where you can hear the whole thing in order to defend himself against the way this article was framed now you can see the nasty part or the nasty narrative of this article is shown in the second sentence which claims that Jordan Peterson's interview might be a parable about toxic masculinity. Now, he didn't talk about any of this shit. The author is clearly a bit feministy, third wave feministy, aka a bit cunty. And so Jordan Peterson was admirably, albeit in my opinion, foolishly honest with this interviewer. And so opening his heart and telling all his personal secrets to someone who wants to cut you down and someone who feels bitter about previous Jordan B. Peterson interviews where he cites facts about the differences between men and women. You don't want to, you don't want to give that information to such an interviewer, but he did that. And so she's taken all that information that he confided in her about and she's mocking him about toxic masculinity that's really sick imagine someone came to you who nearly died and they've been through a whole load of shit with their family and you take what they've said and you conflate it with other stuff about toxic masculinity in order to frame them as a bad person to push your leftist agenda that's what the author did and yes it was a very evil thing to do however i have listened to the whole transcript of what jordan b peterson said in his interview and although the author clearly is a bit of a dickish lefty i kind of see what she's saying about the confusion regarding this interview it, it was rambling as fuck it wasn't delivered particularly well so anyways this is proper dark backstabbing shit it's disgusting to draw that inference from what was said by jordan B. Peterson. I listened to it all. Regarding the interview itself, I'm going to give you a kind of summary of what was actually said in it, judging from the audio that Jordan B. Peterson actually played. It starts off by saying, by Jordan saying how much he's affected by interviews. The interviewer says, are you affected by these interviews? You come across as infallible. And he does. And he says, no, actually, I'm not infallible at all. I'm really affected by these interviews. He said, I'm not the man people think I am. I'm not unaffected. And he said, basically, his worst experiences since becoming a public figure are due to these kind of interviews. And he said the worst ones are the ones where the interviewer is very hostile and the hostility continues after the interview. Oh, the irony, because this is exactly what is happening now. So that's off the bat, Jordan B. Peterson tries to just ask the interviewer to be reasonable and not do what all the other interviewers have done and stab him in the back. But that's exactly what they did. So that doesn't really give you a lot of faith in the human race and make you want to be honest, does it? So I can't really see much good coming from this interview. Now, Jordan B. Peterson breaks down into tears right at the beginning of this interview. And this concerns me. People who cry a lot, 
especially adults, often they're on the verge of a nervous breakdown. People are emotionally unstable. And I have noticed this trait in Jordan B. Peterson before. So is this a, is this a pattern? In some ways, you can argue that men crying shows a lot of strength because there's a stigma against men crying. But then during an interview where you need to keep your cool and c come across well and for the person to like you, probably best not to break that into tears. But maybe I'm being too harsh because Jordan B. Peterson has been through an awful lot of shit recently. Anyways, the interviewer must have been licking her lips because the guy she's interviewing, who she's already sharpening her knives towards in her plan to make a hit piece he's breaking down crying so jordan b peterson went on to say that he's been misrepresented many times um at the end of the interview he he asked the interviewer if she was satisfied and to make sure she was satisfied and jordan said that he also wanted to be satisfied they both had an interest in their own satisfaction so he left the door open he was very amicable and kind about it all Jordan B. Peterson finished by saying people focus too much on the details of his illness. And he said that the purpose of this interview is just to help people find meaning in life through the message that meaning justifies suffering. And Jordan said no one's delivering that message. And the journalist didn't respect his wishes at all. So he opened the interview by saying people misrepresent him and go after him and he ended the interview by saying people focus too much on his illness so the interviewer did stab him in the back but but his daughter Mi Mikhail I don't even know how you pronounce it let's have a look his daughter was basically shepherding Jordan Peterson throughout the whole interview and when Jordan's interview finished she took over and then her name's Mick Hyler. So Mick Hyler took over and then went into great detail about Jordan B. Peterson's sickness. So Jordan B. Peterson ended the interview and said he didn't want to focus too much on the sickness, even though they talked about it shitloads. And then his daughter talked about the sickness for an hour. I'm going to tell you my thoughts about Mick Hyler Peterson. So when Jordan was crying, Mick Hyler said he hasn't done an interview in a long time. Now, look, Mick Hyler should not be managing Jordan B. Peterson. She kept butting into the conversation. What the fuck is she doing? She shouldn't be involved here. I can see why the interviewer attacked, although I don't think it's right, I can see why she attacked the Peterson family for the interview being weird because it kind of was weird what was his daughter doing there she wasn't adding anything at all it felt like this uneducated daughter or not un uneducated but lacking in experience daughter kept butting in hyperactively and it just it sounded like a mess it is a breach of trust because it's a family confiding in the interviewer but still the peterson family should know this you don't want to you got to get it right when you're going up with the the times and you're being interviewed on the world stage. Jordan B. Peterson needs a manager. He needs a proper manager where there isn't some emotional conflict and history, he needs someone who's all about the business and knows what is best for Jordan Peterson and knows how to present him and market him and further the Jordan Peterson brand. His daughter did not do that at all, even though, in my opinion, but even though she was just trying to help. So, yeah, his daughter, Mick Hyler, is presiding over all of this. My thoughts on Mick Hyler, forgive me if I'm wrong on this. I just want to say how I feel about it. I see, I see his daughter, Mick Hyler, as someone who's a bit on, on Jordan's coattails. Ever since he came back into the public eye... I've seen his daughter shadowing him. I think the first time I saw him come back, his daughter was all glammed up, looking sexy with this blonde hair. She'd gone to the hairdresser. And I thought, what am I seeing here? I came here for Jordan Peterson and I'm seeing his daughter looking really hot and taking a lot of control. And Jordan seemed really weak. That was what I got across. It seemed a bit like nepotism, like Jordan Peterson trying to put his daughter on. His daughter's famous for basically a carnivore diet. She calls the lion diet. She was very sick as a kid and just eating meat and even no vegetables, I believe. 
apparently was a miracle cure for her. So she put her mum and dad on it. The mother contracted cancer while she was on the diet, I believe. Jordan B. Peterson broke down while he was on the diet, I believe. We we're always seeing his daughter's face. She's in Jordan's podcast. She looks ravishing. She has her own podcast as well. And Jordan B. Peterson comes on there. I'll be honest, I don't care. I, her daughter doesn't give me anything that her, her dad doesn't. You know, her dad is a genius. He's a one in a lifetime personality who helps people who are looking for meaning in their lives. His daughter hasn't had the same education or experience and they need to they need to separate their brands because it's it's confusing Jordan B. Peterson's brand. Now to Mick Hyler's credit, she was very sick as a kid and this diet saved her and she she wants to share it with people. She means well, I think. She has a baby herself and she had to uproot where she was living three or four times moving around the world in order to help her dad who nearly died, who was suicidal and dying of drug withdrawals. So her daughter is clearly a good person, but this is a mess right now. Jordan Peterson is a mess. He couldn't get through the interview without breaking down many times. He's been through a lot of shit. I'm going to tell you stuff about what Jordan said, which is shocking. I mean, he can't even fucking walk properly. He's still fucked up. So the guy's a mess. But obviously, this is his life's work, and this is what gives him meaning. And without his book and these public appearances, he's got nothing left. So I understand it's very brave, and he has to do it. And we're seeing the kind of negative effects of that while he tries to adapt to this market after and during his recovery. So I want to be a little bit careful when I criticize. I don't want to criticize too harshly. But the branding is wrong, and Mick Hyler shouldn't be the face of this, and Mick Hyler shouldn't be involved in these interviews. So it's funny, these brands, Jordan Peterson and Ben Shapiro as well, their whole brand is built on something that maybe they don't want to accept is the main reason why people like them and the main reason why they became famous. And it is this, it is going into a public debate and smashing people in a public debate. That is one of the most inspirational things you can see. Someone going to Lion's Den and intellectually defeating someone and coming out on top. Jordan B. Peterson did that multiple times, especially with the Kathy Newman interview. And that timing was amazing. He obviously didn't plan that, but the stars aligned and that was just before his book released. So his book became huge, partly off the back of that. Ben Shapiro as well, demolishing people in public debates. That's why people love him and follow him and look to him as some kind of leader and savior. That is what will market this book. And I'm not saying if you're not feeling up to it mentally, you don't have to go into the lion's den. But if you really want to promote the book, you go into the lion's den against people in a public debate and you smash them and your book's going to sell loads of copies. That's not how they're angling for this book. And ironically, that's kind of the stance the interviewer took. But Jordan B. Peterson didn't take that stance, which is the stance that helped to catapult his book to fame originally. And so he got beaten up for it. So he might as well have just gone into that interview on the offense and had a debate. And he would have come off all the better for it. So Jordan B. Peterson did try to explain what the fuck happened. So over on his official website, it says, Jordan, it, it says why I stupidly agreed to an interview request from the Sunday Times. So this is really interesting, listening to Jordan Peterson's reasoning for doing this interview. He said, I was recently the subject of a Sunday Times cover story written by Decker Aitkinson. Non-subscribers who wish to read it can sign up for two free articles a week here. I released the full audio of the interview on YouTube so that anyone interested could find out for themselves what was actually said. Given the tenor of the piece, very critical of me and even more of my daughter, Mick Hyler, and the fact that I have been subject to very similar unflattering coverage many times in the past, it appears reasonable for even those inclined to my defence to ask, how could I possibly have been stupid enough to agree to the interview and story? The same question has been plaguing me. In consequence, I went back to the original letter of invitation I received from one of the Sunday Times' acquisition editors, Miss Megan Agnew, here it is in its entirety. So this is the invitation to Jordan Peterson to have an interview. 
They say, we would love to send one of our writers to speak with him for the magazine. I like to think we tell difficult stories with generous space, time and objectivity. We run long form features telling the whole story rather than short, flashy headlines. So the, they requested an interview and they sounded really nice and kind. And then they fucked him over. And Jordan B. Peterson responded to the email and he said, Dear Mrs. Agnew, I reread this polite, positive and hopeful interview request letter of today after the promised Sunday Times piece on my, on my daughter and I was published. I can't help but be struck by the vast gap between what was offered and the resulting interview, which no reasonable reader could possibly consider celebrating my life and career so far. In consequence, I have decided to write you and ask for your opinion on what has happened as a consequence of your invitation. The words you chose in your invitation, for example, quote, hoping that he is doing better, end quote. Such an exhausting, uncompromising virus. It must be an incredibly stressful time for you all when the time feels right, end quote. Were couched in such markedly friendly and supportive language that I allowed myself to trust the times to deliver the story in the manner you proposed. I believed in good faith that my life and career as well as my health would be discussed fairly without prejudice. My editors and publishers at Penguin Random House had the same faith, relying on their belief in the integrity of your paper. I do not think that it is mere thin-skinned sensitivity on my part to believe that I would have fared no worse had I discussed my affairs with an avowed enemy. And what was done to my daughter, who uprooted her husband and small daughter more than a dozen times, I said three or four times, it was actually a dozen, to accompany and care for me in four countries in the last year, while simultaneously dealing with her own severe health issues, skeptically described by your author and the near death of her mother, was brutally unfair, callous and cold. Her illness, thoroughly documented over the multiple years at the Toronto Hospital for Sick Children, resulted in the shattering and painful disintegration of her right hip and left ankle and their surgical replacement of both before she was 17. She had 38 joints afflicted with degenerative arthritis, suffering from one of the most severe cases of juvenile RA her attending physicians had ever encountered. Her prognosis at age eight was continual, multiple joint replacements, if exactly the sort that eventually occurred. In her teenage years, she walked around on what were essentially two broken legs for more than a year while we arranged for corrective surgeries, while her mother and I desperately searched for medical expertise across many countries. And she managed to stay in school and forged forwards unstoppably despite all that. But the thing is, Jordan, that doesn't make her a good manager for you. And that's where the problem is. Sometimes helping can hurt. And of course, her helping him, in my opinion, you know, uprooting and helping him get the care he needs is great. But actually being your manager and sitting in on these podcasts and then ending the podcast, uh, the interview, sorry, and then ending the interview with just a one-on-one -on -one with your daughter and the interviewer, especially knowing the interviewer's intentions, it's just suicidal. Jordan Peterson continued in his response to the Times. He said, and she managed to stay in school and forged forwards unstoppably despite all that. There is simply no excuse for Aikenhead to imply that the reality of all of this is somehow questionable, as she clearly did when she opened her discussion of Mick Hyler's illness with the words, quote, according to her website, end quote. No, not, quote, according to her website, end quote, with the sly intimation of falsehood hinted at by such phrasing. Actually, in painful reality, over many long years and immediately verifiable, all not, by a simple request to the medical authority involved. Jordan B. Peterson is far too intelligent for these uh, writers at the Times. He could write that whole newspaper on his own with a good editor. So it's, it's almost as if his intellect is wasted here, which is just crazy. But he finishes off by saying, I am frankly stunned by the degree of sheer cruelty and spite manifested by your journalist, Decker Aitkinhead, and by the degree of misrepresentation if that's what it is, necessary to entice me into speaking as I did with her, with no intention on my part other than to answer the questions she put to me as clearly and honestly as my deeply flawed self could manage. Given the manner in which you crafted your invitation to me, I can't understand how you can in good conscience accept what transpired. Sincerely, Jordan. So he says, I have not yet received a response to this letter. I haven't received a response, but it was only sent yesterday. I'll post whatever I receive. Was I unforgivably careless in the trust I chose to show the Times? Perhaps. I believed, as my editors and publishers at Penguin Random House, that my story was invariably going to be told and that it was therefore appropriate to provide the details in as truthful and complete a manner possible to the most reliable and credible possible source. We all took the offer from the Sunday Times at face value and held that paper in high regard. 
hence our decision which was considered over months. Now the situation is complicated by the fact I have a new book coming out March the 2nd. This means that the decision to participate in the Sunday Times interview was also motivated by a desire not so much to publicize the book as to clear the stage that the book might be made the central topic of any other interviews I might give around its launch time instead of issues such as my health. I certainly feel an obligation to work with and for my publishers so that the book's existence is publicized and there's obviously an element of self-interest in that as well. I want to act such that the book has the highest possible chance of success. I hope that the people will find it as useful as they appear to have found my previous book, 12 Rules for Life. Well, so Jordan B. Peterson is answering some of my questions. Why are you focusing on your health? Well, he said he wants to get the health topics out of the way so later he can focus on the book. That's what he's saying. Although I have already heard this and he could have just released this in a controlled public statement. Why he had to go to the Times, I don't know, but he's already asking himself the same question. Peterson continues, so what would a wise man do? Learn my lesson and avoid the press at all costs? But I don't know how to distinguish that from turning my tail and hiding. And I think that would be worse for me, even in my currently compromised state, than continuing to engage as I have. So he can't really win. He could r- turn it away and hide, but then he's not going to develop as a person. But then if he, if he doesn't hide and he faces it, he's going to have to put up with bullshit like this. I've got an idea. Get a manager, Jordan. Jordan says only choose to make myself available to outlets that will produce positive coverage first how do i know which outlets are trustworthy i could only talk to people with whom i have become friendly such as david rubin and joe rogan but i don't think it's right to stay inside what risks becoming a mere echo chamber so jordan is very brave for all of the negative aspects of this this is what this is the mentality that made him big in the first place so i don't think he should stop what he's doing he's obviously going to learn from it i still think he should get a manager maybe that's too simplistic an answer what do you think leave your comments in the box below but still you can tell he's really struggling and he's still putting himself out there which is amazing wow life at the top is not simple huh he says, what is it, was this a mistake for me to conduct the now infamous Channel 4 interview with Kathy Newman? Or the almost, these, these have like 22 million views plus. Or the almost equally viewed GQ interview with Helen Lewis? Both of those were markedly hostile. Were they failures or successes? At Jordan, they weren't failures. This is why your book was so popular. He says, I don't think it is unreasonable to note that they are markedly of our time and perhaps indicate something important, whatever that might be, about our time. Both have garnered some 25 million views. There's something of broad public Public interest about the tension that characterizes both conversations and this should be your whole strategy is, is is engineer a couple of those boom your book sales are going to be through the roof baby gq jordan says motivated by the success question mark of the helen lewis interview plans to produce a profile on me in the near future i have been asked to make myself available for an interview should i do it i haven't decided if it goes badly will i only have myself to blame should i therefore avoid it I hope to be judicious in my decisions about when and where to speak. I hope that I can stick to the truth when I do so and believe that there is no better defense and indeed no better offense than that. Do I trust myself to tell the truth? Will my ego invariably get in the way? Has that already happened? As the man says, you pays your money and you takes your chances. So Jordan B. Peterson, right at the end, he's very thought provoking. He's very philosophical. He truly is a modern day philosophical genius i love the guy and he clears up quite a lot there look i'm talking about it a lot of people are talking about it no press is bad press this is still going to be good press for jordan b peterson this interview regardless of how it's been framed and how you're receiving it now to clear up the schizophrenia stuff this is what jordan b peterson said about schizophrenia So we're going over to conservativereview.com. They say one such Twitter user named Rob Henderson points out parts of the interview transcript which are inaccurate. He highlights this. It took until August this summer to actually diagnose him with akathisia, which is a side effect of a medication. But he was bounced from, you know, bipolar depression. One person diagnosed him with schizophrenia. It was like he's just not... He's in pain because of these medications. One of the conversations we had with this psychiatrist, he has, he goes, well, we think it's schizophrenia. And I was like, these symptoms didn't even start until he started the medications. Okay, so you're telling me like a mid 50 year old man with no previous symptoms of schizophrenia suddenly gets schizophrenia, which generally happens late teens for men. 
So that's what was said about schizophrenia. So it doesn't appear as if Jordan B. Peterson really has schizophrenia, and I certainly hope he doesn't. However, he is not in a stable state. He's in a very bad way. Now, I've had premonitions of this. I've seen him crying quite a lot. And on the one hand, yeah, I respect men who cry and who feel comfortable and who are honest enough to do that on a stage. That actually takes real balls. But at the same time, I also wonder, is this guy all there? And he's often talked about taking drugs, mind-altering pharmaceuticals, for example, antidepressants and various other things. And when he said that, I started to get a little bit suspicious because, and I don't really, I don't have any evidence. This is just my own personal feeling. So you can, you can make of this what you will. But I've known a lot of people who've taken antidepressants and a lot of them struggle to get off them. And on the one hand, you can argue, well, they need them and they're just self-destructive. But on the, on the other hand, the people I know who've really overcome anxiety and depression have not done it with a pill. It seems to me if life were that easy, then everyone would take it and there'd be no real major side effects. You could just flick a switch and like magic, you suddenly feel better. And that's just impossible. The only way to feel better is through life choices, in my opinion, through cutting out the bad things in your life. Um, you know, forging new neural pathways, taking up activities, doing things that help you grow as a person, doing it, confronting the anxiety, making anxiety your bitch, and actually making a stand and making the changes required in order to feel better about yourself and feel more satisfied, perhaps being more spiritual, all those things. I just don't think pills are the answer. And when I heard Jordan B. Peterson so casually talk about all the medications he's been taking, coupled with him crying and stuff, I, I felt well, maybe this guy is sicker than people realize. And a lot of psychiatrists, some of the best ones, are very sick themselves. And the reason they become psychiatrists is because they want to cure themselves. And that's how they know so much about it. So I do, I do wonder. I, I had some premonitions about Jordan B. Peterson and his mental health some time ago. But what do I know? I'm just a peon compared to this guy. But I'm just telling you honestly how I felt about Jordan B. Peterson so Mikhaila, after the interview ended, she went on and told the interviewer so much personal information. Quote, he came off antidepressants in 2016 and was pale. He was on them for 14 years. Why are you telling this, this schmuck your dad's mental history and his mental drug history? Do not do this. Do not do this. The average person does not understand mental illness. So when they read that, they're just going to think, oh, this guy's crazy. You only tell the people who love you and care about you. There's no need to be sharing that stuff. Although I see she's got those traits from her father where he's honest and he says it's the best attack and defense. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe after this, he's got nothing left to hide and it will only be to his strength. But I just think it, people don't understand it, so They don't need to know about it. I don't understand why you would expose all your weak points like this. Mick Hyler rambled on about Jordan B. Peterson's medical history. Almost excitably. She was almost excitably doing it. I think it's foolish. And I think the author has a point, And I don't want to say that. It's, it's not weird, as she said. But it's easy to frame the interview as weird if the interview takes this form. She talked about Jordan B. Peterson being suicidal. Really? That's only something your dad should be able to say. And if I was his manager, I would ask him to steer clear of that and focus on the book. But hey, that's just me. But the author, what a bitch. When Mick Hyler was saying this, the author was reacting and saying, oh God, that's terrible. What a bitch. And then she turned around and, and wrote this horrible thing about this guy. There's no humanity in this at all. The guy is clearly really brave what he's doing. And you talk about toxic masculinity. You are so ideologically possessed that you commit that kind of evil, that's terrible. The, you know, then the daughter, Mikhaila, was trying to work out what was wrong with Jordan. The doctor said it might be withdrawal or reactions to medications. How about this? Scrambling your brain with SSRI antidepressants for 15 years and then suddenly stopping might have an effect on you? Maybe? Just an idea. I could be wrong, but I just want to ask that question. And I want to say that so much negative shit in this article came from Jordan B. Peterson's daughter, Mick Hyler's insane decision to pour out all of Jordan's medical history. She's just not helping here, even though she's trying to. I think she needs to get out of the way. Do not talk about your personal mental health history to people who don't wish you well and who broadcast it in a framework to people who don't understand mental health. Anyways, back to Jordan. I do love him a lot. He's in a state 
Mikhaila said he can't even walk properly in the fucking mornings. Jordan B. Peterson said getting back into these interviews is like go- trying to jump back into a car going at 900 miles per hour. So this is really tough for him. Jordan said if he had lost the book, he wouldn't have had anything. So his whole life is in this book. So I can't wait to buy it. You've got to read it. He, this is the thing that kept him alive and kept him motivated and gave him meaning in life. It takes balls to be himself up there. And that's what he did, whether it's right or wrong, whether his daughter should be there or shouldn't. It took. It takes balls to do this. So what can we do to show our support for Jordan B. Peterson in the face of these hit pieces? Well, you can buy his book. It is coming out on March the 3rd. So I would urge all my viewers to buy it. Look, it looks like this. Jordan B. Peterson, Beyond Order, 12 More Rules for Life. Sorry, coming out March the 2nd. So I'm going to pre-order that now to show my support for Jordan B. Peterson so that interview didn't go as badly as I thought because we've already seen the other side of Jordan Peterson kicking ass, but now we're seeing him getting his ass kicked a bit. It's a, it's like a good story and we all want to see the hero win in the end and now we are in control of the story. If we all buy his book, he will win in the end. So this empowers the people. So let's buy his book and let's make a happy ending to this tale. One final thing in this interview was really interesting. He was actually coaxed into giving his opinion on American politics with Trump and Biden. And I found what he said fascinating. I thought the world needed Jordan B. Peterson in the build up to the Trump Biden election what with all the Marxism and Marxist uprising shit going on with Black Lives Matter and Antifa. But obviously he was too sick to do it. This is what Jordan B. Peterson said about the current state of politics, which is fascinating. Listen to this. He said, and this is on his audio transcripts, which I listened to the whole thing. He said, the left and the right are antagonizing each other. He said that it's very difficult to dampen it down once this game starts. And the mainstream media has allowed this to happen, in my opinion, by normalizing leftist violence of Black Lives Matter and Antifa. Jordan B. Peterson says, if Biden is wise, he'll dampen it down. And... My Biden teleprompter says, ha, 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 ha. Biden has pitted races and gender against each other already. He has. He's given people jobs in his cabinet based on the accent of birth because they're female, which makes men feel resentful. He's he's giving people jobs because of the color of their skin, which is going to make people who are of other skin colors feel resentful. And it's basically, it basically sends out the message that you're worth is completely random based on skin color and not your ability. So that is not dampening things down. Anyways, Jordan B. Peterson said, quote, Biden could leave the identity politics behind and rule in a Clinton-esque fashion, end quote. But no, he appointed a tranny in charge of public health who's really unhealthy. He prioritized young blacks over older whites for corona vaccines and so on. But here you could you could see Jordan B. Peterson is still sharp as fuck. When he was talking about politics, he, he hadn't lost any mental acuity at all. Jordan B. Peterson said he thinks impeachment will only amplify the division. Peterson thinks the best thing to do is let Trump fade away. He's going anyways. Why impeach him? It's out of spite, obviously. And the Democrats don't want to dampen things down. But anyways... Jordan B. Peterson should be president of America, in my opinion, (laughs) if only that were possible. He said the Dems could busy themselves getting vaccinations out. Biden could be successful if he vaccinated 300 million Americans. Quote, I don't think stoking the flames is a good idea, end quote. So instead, they're focusing on impeachment and making people more divided. Jordan B. Peterson said, I could see what was coming. Too much ideological nonsense, too much identity politics. Dems alienated their working class voter base who stood by them for decades on the altar of identity politics because they have no policy making procedure. So the radicals control the rudder because they have a narrative and the centrists don't. But there is a story that the centrists could make peace and prosperity for all of us, low cost energy, programs that benefit everyone, including the poor, as poverty hurts the country. It's an unbelievably deep problem. And cheap ideological solutions will not solve it. Inequality is not a product of capitalism. There's no evidence for that whatsoever. The left continued attempts to blame inequality on capitalism. And this is self-defeating. Peterson said, if you were truly concerned with poor, you do everything you could to make them rich. And the fastest way to do that is through free markets. Evidence is clear. Since communism collapsed, the amount of poor people has fallen by half. 
China, China just announced it has left poverty. And by 2030, there'll pretty much be no poverty left anywhere in the world. That's Jordan B. Peterson talking about the necessity of free markets, which leftists spend all day trying to tear down. He said, there are alternatives to this ideological idiocy that is threatening US stability. It was beautiful what he said. And Jordan B. Peterson still has faith. He said that Americans have come through a lot of shit. And if Biden can keep the radicals under control, he doesn't have to pander to the radicals. But Jordan said he's seen evidence of pandering already. And I'm seeing it on a daily basis. So it looks like Biden is a puppet for the radicals and things are going to get a lot worse before they get better. But hey, the pendulum swings the other way, motherfuckers. So you can keep pushing it as far as you want. But, and I predict, the economy will crash in around June this year latest july but i think it's going to happen end of june and when that happens and when people have no money you're going to see the biggest backlash against the democrats you've ever fucking seen because everything they're doing right now is not going to help the economy and it's only taking away jobs but without going too deep into that jordan b peterson ends in tears crying again saying how unbelievably amazing it is to be able to sit down and do an interview presumably because he was so close to death so maybe I feel I've been a bit harsh on Jordan. It's just the way that it's presented. If I, if I was, if I were his manager, I know he's got to go out there, but I try to steer away from these emotional topics. And I wouldn't have his daughter there and we keep it on track. And I wouldn't have Jordan beg the interviewer to be nice to him. I would lay down the fucking law before it starts and we, we roughly outline where we're going on it. And if they try to if they try to goad him or get too personal about his mental health history, Jordan should stop it or I, I jump in and say, no, let's keep this on topic. I just think it needs it needs some kind of management like that. But that's just my opinion. What do you think? Wow, okay. So that was a 40 minute opening segment on Jordan B. Peterson. You can tell I'm very interested in him and I admire him very much indeed. So, in other news, Marilyn Manson, he's been accused of rape. Have a look at this. Vanity Fair says he, quote, horrifically abused me for years, end quote. Evan Rachel Wood and other women make allegations of abuse against Marilyn Manson. Update, Manson responds on Instagram, calling accusations, quote, horrible distortions of reality, end quote. His record label drops him. Rose McGowan speaks out in support of the accusers. Okay, so in the past, actor and activist Evan Rachel Wood has spoken about the alleged abuse she was subjected to by an unnamed ex. In an Instagram post, early Monday morning, she put a name to the allegations. Quote, the name of my abuser is Brian Warner, also known to the world as Marilyn Manson, end quote, Wood wrote. He started grooming me when I was a teenager and horrifically abused me for years. I was brainwashed and manipulated into submission. I am done living in fear of retaliation, slander or blackmail. I'm here to expose this dangerous man and call out the many industries that have enabled him before he ruins any more lives. I stand with the many victims who will no longer be silent. In a show of solidarity, at least four other women posted their own allegations against Manson, detailing harrowing experiences that they claim included sexual assault, psychological abuse and or various forms of coercion, violence and intimidation. After being quickly dropped by his record label, Loma Vista, and cut from a TV series, Manson posted a statement to his Instagram account, making a sweeping denial without addressing any of the women's specific allegations. Quote, Obviously, my art and life have long been magnets for controversy, but these recent claims about me are horrible distortions of reality. My intimate relationships have always been entirely consensual with like-minded partners. This sounds like his lawyer's written it. Regardless of how and why others are now choosing to misrepresent the past, that is the truth. So there is Marilyn Manson posting that message to his 3.6 million followers on Instagram. So... This is disappointing to hear because Marilyn Manson had a lot of smart things to, th to say about gun crime and shit like that back in the day. I didn't even know he was releasing music still. I'm sure he's got an insane fortune, so he'll be all right. But with stuff like this, obviously it's innocent until proven guilty. We have to see what goes on in the courts. There is motivation sometimes by women to make these claims because of financial reasons. But at the same time, five people coming forward and making sexual assault claims, that ain't good. So we're going to have to wait and see 
it would be disappointing because Marilyn Manson, he's one of those people who looks like a bit of a bad boy or a terrible person because of his makeup and his image. But actually, a lot of people said it, it was the opposite. Inside, he was a smart guy, quasi-intellectual, and a very well-meaning person. But if this is true, it just it basically supports Judge a Book by its cover, which I don't like. But I just thought I'd bring you that news anyway, because that is big fucking news from the world of entertainment. Let's see how that develops as time continues. So next off, Australia says, fuck off, Mike, to Google. So it looks like Australia have fallen out with Google and Google might not even be in Australia anymore, which makes me happy because Google are authoritarian cunts. So what the fuck is going on with Australia and Google? Well, over on Soiters.com, they say, as Google eyes, Australia exit. Microsoft talks Bing with PM. Bing being Microsoft's such engine who seems to be ready to step in and take Google's place. Who wouldn't? Software giant Microsoft Corporation is confident its search product can Bing can fill the gap in Australia if Google pulls out its search over required payments to media outlets, Prime Minister Scott Morrison said on Monday. Australia has introduced laws that would force internet giant Google and social media heavyweight Facebook to negotiate payments to domestic media outlets whose content links drive traffic to their platforms. However, the big tech firms have called the laws unworkable and said last month that they would withdraw key services from Australia if the regulations went ahead. Those services include Google's search engine, which has 94% of the country's search market, according to industry data. I don't care what's going on here or what the politics are. If a search engine has 94% of the country's search market and that search engine's owners are hard leftists and like to do censorship, then it's fucking good that this is happening. It seems to be that on Google and whatever and Facebook, anyone can post a link and that will go to the link's destination, which is often news websites. But the news websites aren't getting any money, and yet Facebook are using them as, as, as some kind of aggregator and benefiting off these services for free. So it only makes sense that people make money for that. So that's pretty interesting. Unfortunately, they're not getting rid of Google because of censorship. That's what I want to see. Australia threatens to get rid of Google because of censorship unless they stop censoring and shaping the world narrative to some leftist dystopian bullshit. But that's not the case. It's over some other shit. But it's good to see more small signs that big tech's dominance is slowly being challenged. Let's just see how this progresses. So... AOC. So AOC, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, she came out and she said this. Going over to abc.net.eu. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez reveals in Instagram video she is a sexual assault survivor. So this was done during an emotional broadcast in which she recounted her experience of the Capitol insurrection. She said this to 150,000 viewers among her 8.7 million followers. She said, quote, I'm a survivor of sexual assault, end quote, she said, while seeming to hold back tears. And I haven't told many people that in my life, but when we go through trauma, trauma compounds on each other. The Congresswoman described being terrified for her life during the storming of the Capitol. She called for Republican politicians to be held accountable and accused members of the GOP of using the tactics of abusers by encouraging rioters. I'm not going to let it happen to me again. I'm not going to let it happen to the people victimized by the situation again. And I'm not going to let it happen to our country, she said. She condemns Republican calls to move on from the incident in which five people died, who one of which was a Republican or more, and dozens of police were injured. She says, the reason I'm getting emotional in this moment is because these folks who tell us to move on, that it's not a big deal, that we should forget what's happened or even telling us to apologize. These are the same tactics of abusers. So she's basically using her claims of being abused to compare Republicans to abusers, to compare people saying you should move on from the Capitol Hill surrection to people who abused her. So she's using her abuse in order to paint anyone who disagrees with her as an abuser. Oh, fuck me. This is the kind of thing I expect from radical people. Even if she were abused, in order to then take that and smear people as abusers, presumably sexual abusers, 
is rather evil if you're using that as something political. You turn anything to your political advantage. That shows how ideologically possessed you are, I guess. I guess she's beyond help if she's doing that. I don't want to criticise her because if you criticise her now, guess what? You'll be called a sexual abuse denier. You see the power levels here? But she's someone who's well associated with the grievance industry and she trades in grievance. And that's the problem. It's like you cry wolf so many times, you call speech violence, then when you claim to be the victim of abuse, is it the kind of violence or harm that's verbal when a guy cat called you? Or was it real sexual abuse? It's all purposefully very ambiguous, I guess. But you see how this works now, right? You, you can't criticize her or you're going to be called a sympathizer of an abuser. And this is why Joe Biden has puts a lot of women and people of color in his cabinet, because then if you criticize them, it's because you're sexist or you're racist. And in this case, this is a catch-all victimization strategy where this happened to me. So now you can't criticize me at all. I don't know about you, but I would never use my personal problems to protect myself or demonize others. When have you ever seen me do it in all 173 episodes of the Johnny Massacre show? I just won't do it because that's amplifying the evil. If somebody commits some evil to me and then I use that example to make myself immune to criticism and then paint other people as evil as those abusers, that is kind of amplifying the evil. I wouldn't give my abuser that kind of privilege. And the only people I've really attacked on this show in regards to that is sexual abusers who literally have sexually abused people in regards to rape and stuff like that. I said that those people should be put to death and I stand by it. Do I say Democrats and liberals are like abusers, like those abusers? No, I don't because I wouldn't tar them with the same brush. So even if she was abused and if she was, I'm very sorry to hear it. I don't think she should be calling her political enemies on par with those abusers. So, yeah, you know, climate change affects black people, right? And coronavirus affects black people more than white people, right? So if you criticize climate change or, or you question coronavirus vaccine rollout, you are racist, right? And now if you, if you question anything AOC says, you're basically a misogynist scumbag. You see how this works? All right. In other news, Myanmar has been taken... Fuck, there's loads of news today. Myanmar has been taken over in a military coup. What the fuck is going on in the world well, let's have a look, shall we? We're going over to reddit.com and they have this post. It says, the Burmese military has arrested the country's leaders after credible evidence of widespread voter fraud became impossible to ignore. And let's read about the Myanmar coup, coup latest. It says, 12.10 a.m., U.S. President Joe Biden calls the military seizure of power in Myanmar, quote, a direct assault on the country's transition to democracy and the rule of law, adding, end quote, adding that relevant American sanctions will undergo an immediate review. Biden then said, quote, the international community should come together in one voice to press the Burmese military to immediately relinquish the power they have seized, release the activists and officials they have detained, lift all telecommunications restrictions and refrain from violence against civilians. But wait a minute, Biden's asking Myanmar to lift all telecommunications restrictions when all there's loads of restrictions that he's overseen and hasn't even mentioned in telecommunications regarding anyone questioning the US election. So Biden can't do that. That's very hypocritical. Biden then says the US is, quote, taking note of those who stand with the people of Burma in this difficult hour and will work with our partners throughout the region and the world to support the restoration of democracy and rule of law. Well, if you're not even willing to give the appearance of a free and fair election, then no one's going to trust you. And you've actually just put wind in the sails of the Myanmar army. You basically legitimize them because America's elections there was no transparent audit and there was loads of mail-in ballots without the provision to have a proper count. So now the military over in Myanmar or wherever, over in Russia, the politicians in Russia can just say, no, no, this, um, we don't need to recount this. We don't need to do it again. Everything's fine because America did that. That's why it's so important to have the appearance of free and fair elections, America. Just saying. 
So that's going on, which is fucking mad. And yeah, well, the person telling Myanmar to give the appearance of a free and fair election, the person telling the Myanmar military to back down and claiming he's very transparent when it comes to elections. He's this person. Have a look at these stats. Now, I'm just giving you stats. I'm not saying my opinion. You just, you make up your own opinion. This could be the greatest example of democracy of all time, or it could be something else. So let, let's look at the stats behind Obama, Biden, and Trump. Obama winning the presidency, Biden winning the presidency, and Trump losing the presidency. So Obama got 69 million votes, Trump got 74 million, and Biden got 81 million. But Biden has no crowds whatsoever. Obama and Trump had massive crowds. Then we've got the amount of counties that Biden won, which is 477. Obama won double, and Trump won 2,500 counties and yet still lost the election. That means shitloads of people must have voted in small counties, a lot of them Democrat controlled. Biden won one out of 19 bellwether states. Trump and Obama won 18 out of 19 bellwether states. What is a bellwether state? Well, a bellwether state is a state in America whose victor reflects the person who's going to win the presidency, who, whose victory... Sorry, let me say that again. A bellwether state is a state that, if won, reflects the voting habits of the entire country. So if you win one bellwether state, that means everyone in the country is basically going to vote for the person who won that bellwether state. Trump won 18, and so did Obama, and they, they won. Biden won one. And this has been an accurate predictor of presidential elections for 50 years plus. Obama won Florida, Ohio, and Iowa, and so did Trump. Biden lost all three, and those states, usually always when you win those, you win the presidency. Obama won House seats. Trump, his team won every single House seat that was up for grabs, and Biden lost House seats. So this is the person telling Myanmar to get their act together and sh prove that they've had a free and fair election. Just showing you some numbers, that's all. So, moving away from politics, yay, Tony Hawk lands a 720 at the age of 52. So, Tony Hawk is fucking awesome. Basically, the best skater of all time. He didn't invent the fundamental tricks like the ollie and kickflip, but he's, the, he, he's just the best skater of all time, because I said so. And he's fucking amazing. And he's 52, and he's pulled off a 720 spin, which is, as you can imagine, probably pretty, <laughs> pretty difficult. Over on dualshockers.com, they say Tony Hawk lands impressive, 720 at the age of 52, but it was a battle. Back in 2016, he landed a 900 at the age of 48. Tony Hawk has made a rather bittersweet online post about landing a 720 recently, with a video showing him persisting until he finally lands it. Great to see, even at 52, people still have that hunger. The article says, while the extreme sports legend who you'll likely know from the Tony Hawk's pro skater games is no stranger to doing skateboarding at the age of 52, it does seem as if age is becoming a hindrance. Recently, I made a 720 and it was a battle, said the skater on Twitter, recalling the last time he landed a 720 was three years ago. He added that performing this trick was difficult considering he's not long dislocated his fingers back in June last year, so his grab is more difficult. He also stated that his spin is slower, so to compensate for that, he needs to go higher. Oh, and he said he's really old. Here's a Tony Hawk tweet. He says, I recently made a 720 and it was a battle. The last one I made before this was over three years ago, and it's much harder now, all things considered. Recently dislocated fingers hinder my grab. My spin is slower, so I need to go higher for full rotation, and dot, 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 <laughs> I'm really old. So here's Tony Hawk trying to pull off a 720. It's, it's great stuff, very dramatic. So if you're not watching, you're just listening on the podcast, I'll describe to you what's going on. So Tony Hawk is repeatedly trying to pull off this spinning move where he has to rotate 720 degrees. It's edited with footage of him on his hands and knees, burying his head in his hands in despair, not being able to pull off the trick. He looks exasperated. He definitely doesn't look happy. He's looking at the camera and just looking as if he doesn't want to be there. He pulls it off. Throws his board away. Screams, fuck yeah throws his helmet down, slides down on his knee pad, screaming with ecstasy. 
Holy fuck. Beautiful to see. And just to think, he did a 900 four years ago. So my question is, call me a cunt, but where's the 900? Tony went on to say he's unsure if this will be the last 720 he'll ever do, but he's certainly starting to feel the age, it seems. He also offered the skateboard shown in the video to raise money for public skate parts parks having fans donate to the nine club where donations were given to the skate park project yeah and he was the first guy ever to land a 900 spin basically the first guy ever to do it and he did it in competition i believe so tony hawk is kind of fucking amazing and if you're just tuning in i am johnny massacre and welcome to the johnny massacre show this is the monday night massacre but if you've been riding shotgun from the top just in case you forgot Feel free to drop a little dough, cream, bread and cheese on some Massacre merchandise, pretty please. Kick, bleh, click the Teespring and subscribe star links in the description box below. Jeez, a lot of mercy. You can sponsor me that way because I have been demonetized by the tyrannical monster that is Google and YouTube. But what am I going to do about it? So guess what? Some more of my content was removed from YouTube. It was Trump's final roll of the dice. So it was talking. I don't even I can't remember what it was about, but something to do with Trump talking about what he's going to do to try to keep the his presidency. Um, YouTube have removed that from my account. So they're just removing things at random. I'm an honest, well-meaning person. I never call for violence anywhere. Not half as much as some of the leftists and Democrats have done. AOC, we mentioned her in a video today. She's always sympathizing with, with rioters and looters and stuff like that. I've never done anything like that. I just try to have a bit of fun and say my opinion, but Google and our tyrannical overlords are trying to censor everything. It's very sad. Tyranny requires that the truth be silenced, that real history be rewritten and erased, the speech be restricted, and that individual thought be silenced. That is the form of any tyrannical government. And big tech are like a shadow government. I've been saying it for ages. They are a shadow government of the Democrats. The Democrats use them like Goebbels of Nazi Germany used the media in order to push his propaganda and they want some thing called a glacial tongue which is what the nazis did where they infect everything with their ideology be it hollywood movies games sports media search engines it's all one form of thought and youtube are ramping that up now i'm very sorry to say that's why i want you to purchase on my teespring or join me on subscribe star to keep me monetized it will keep me going if you want to see more of these videos And yeah, YouTube, they sent me an email uh, explaining why they removed my content. If, you, if you'd like to see it, I can read it for you. Just bringing it up now in my mail application. So I'll read it to you. I'll read what YouTube said when they removed my latest video. And they're probably going to remove a lot more and I'm never going to get re-monetized. Google, killing dreams since day dot. But I keep going. I keep going. I do it all for you. So, yeah, my, my computer is really struggling today. You can tell it's a bit glitchy with the video. They said, hi, Johnny Masker. We wanted to let you know that our team reviewed your content and we think that it violates our spam, deceptive practices and scams policy. So they're calling me either a scammer they're saying I indulged in deceptive practices by talking about what Trump said he was going to do or spam. So YouTube's contribution is some trannies in a wheelchair with a fucking Rango hijab. And my contribution is reporting on the news in a way that's away from one mode of dangerous totalitarian thought. And yet I am spam. Stick it up your fucking urethra, you cunts. They said, we know that you may not have realized that this was a violation of our policies. Yeah, because you make it up on a whim, you woke twats. Then they said, so we're not applying a strike to your channel. However, we have removed the following content. Trump's last roll of the dice, Johnny Massacre Show 154. We realize that this may be disappointing news, but it's our job to make sure that YouTube is a safe place for all. By making America descend into a tyranny that's run by unelected officials, like all tyrannies start. They start with censorship. YouTube says, if you think this is a mistake, you can appeal this decision. And it's arbitrary. I can appeal it. And they won't say why they deny the appeal. It's arbitrary. What's the point? Anyways, so YouTube did that because they're basically just massive cunts. And 
yeah, so that was kind of funny. So that's about it really for today. I started reading a book on Nazi Germany. It's funny because whenever I start reading a book, I send it to my mate and then he always Googles the author and goes, you know, this guy's a complete libtard. So the, the author of this book, I mean, he didn't say Trump was a fascist, but he was interviewed by Slate and Slate were desperate to get him to say that Trump is orange Hitler. And he kind of flirted with them a little bit but anyways i'm reading a, a book on nazi germany it's really good. it's really really fascinating there's a lot of parallels to right-wing stuff but there's loads of parallels to democratic stuff uh, that what the dems are doing at the moment which is really interesting the book is called the nazis and it's by lawrence rees and i just really recommend it. it it doesn't go into all the military aspect of Nazi Germany, but it goes into the political aspect and how Hitler rose to power. And the part that I'm most interested in is when it talks about censorship and tyranny and how a country descends into tyranny. So on that very, very positive note, I would like to apologize for the lateness of today's Johnny Massacre show, but I did a lot of exercise, I ate a lot of food, and I fell asleep in my beautiful Secret Labs Batman chair, so it cannot be helped. But I do hope that I was able to bring you up to date on what's going on in the world today. Hopefully I won't be censored. Make sure to subscribe to me on Subscribestar and get the Teespring gear in order to get more of these videos. I've been Johnny Masker and I tell you what, mate, you better be back for the next one. Otherwise, I'll be coming around your house. Make sure to like and subscribe and hit that notification bell because that is what all those other cunts tell you to do. Layers.